welcome to GUI and in web browsers slash browsers and connectivity special interest group for 23rd of January 2020. Uh, it's a edition with a twist. So I'll just uh, say that and uh, let Dietrich uh, to provide a context what's new. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as, as uh, I think the blog post is coming out and the, the PR to the, the Teams repo is in progress, but there's a little switcheroos in how we structure the working groups for the first half of 2020 to be able to uh, uh, meet some of the lo longer term goals that we have as a, as a project. Um, and how this affects the, the browsers and, and GUI work is really, really important. Uh, uh, we've kind of decided that we, we have a long, long, you know, one of the barriers that we've had in this browsers group is that connectivity has been a problem. Uh, we did a kind of a review in November of the priorities of the browsers group, uh, and we stack ranked all of the open issues and all of the needs that we had, uh, it, it, all the way down to like, like full native browser implementation. Uh, really kind of like both blue sky stuff and really practical stuff. And then we, then we went through each item and, and, and I, I analyzed each one in the context of the others in the list. And uh, all the top priorities outside of CIDV1 were around connectivity. We're around solving things like how do we how do we get to a world where where if if two browsers are running they both have some level of IPFS support how can they communicate uh, directly to each other and then start layering up connectivity out from there um, and th this comes down to better levels of, of uh, better basically more alignment with what the what the JS the P2P team at least in the short term what they're implementing and how they're implementing it and what uh, options they give us when IPFS is running either in a HTTP based web page, running in a uh, web browser extension with or without superpowers like Devon Brave, running in an IPFS based web page, if that's a thing that is well this year, and also when it, it's running in a Node.js uh, on a server or a local daemon. So we have these multiple different, at least four different operating contexts for JSOPFS. Each one has different connectivity capabilities and also challenges. Uh, but we want to be able to, like the, the, the broadest opportunity from a deployment standpoint there is, H, is IPFS running inside HTTP web pages for now. So making the most of the connectivity options we have there, things like expanding thing to DHT to WebRTC connections and things like that is, is really, really important. Um, so this alignment of what the browsers group is doing and what the libp group is doing in, in the JS P2P land is extremely important strategically for us to be able to set up an IPFS that works for where developers are today. Uh, one of the keys that differentiations that I, I make when I think about the strategy is the difference. We talk a lot about adoption, like how do we, how do we increase the adoption of IPFS? How do we get into more people's hands? How do we make it easier? Developer workflows, things like that. But a distinction that I want to make is, is that adoption is really predicated upon uh, availability upon the idea that, that, that IPFS is actually there to be adopted. And for IPFS to be a, a available in that sense, in that distinction, for web developers who are developing web, traditional websites, for even D-Web developers who are developing dApps, and for browser vendors who are considering implementation in, in native integration, we need to have a, a, a very clear availability story. Where, in what context that I just described is, is IPFS available? What are, the, what are the features that it brings in those contexts and what are the constraints that it hits? And uh, be able to communicate that so they can make decisions around whether it's available for them. And if it is, uh, then, they can, then they can actually start, start to adopt it. So this is kind of the thinking around how I look at the prioritization decisions that we need to make uh, when it comes to browser connectivity. I really encourage you as a group to really start thinking about the changes in terms of really specific deployment channels. Uh, where's the operating context of, of, of IPFS most important? And what connectivity challenges exist in that operating context? If it's IPFS running, JS IPFS running in an HTTP web page, an HTTP web app, if that's the, 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 where we're gonna get the most bang for the buck in terms of making, meeting developers' needs today to be able to get them on that upgrade path to a decentralized web, uh, then we should be prioritizing the connectivity needs of operating in that context, as opposed to say no JS daemons or uh, uh, IPFS JS IPFS running in in a web extension context. So thinking about things in terms of the operating context and then making decisions based on how that affects the availability and adoption efforts of 
uh, browser kind of as a whole, as a broader deployment channel. So that's kind of like just the, the, the four minute summary of how I've been thinking about these things. And, and really that's a product of Lytle and I having these meetings and talking about this stuff, you know, week after week after week after week after week since I, since I joined, trying to figure out how, what, these, what these bigger pieces are and how we move them around in order to be able to get the most leverage we can and in getting IPFS in, into web browsers in all the various forms that, that can take. Uh, and, and, and from that, hopefully that gives some context for you all as you're operating with a, a, a you know, with Lytle with a, a, a one foot in browser land and one foot in JS IPFS land and, and Jacob and, and Vashko with like a whole lot of JS libp2p experience and, and how you're going to operate under the, the uh, looking towards JS IPFS and how it runs and where it needs to run to be able to decide what the most important thing to do is. Does that does that make sense or is that total crazy town? It's a very good summary yep. of where we are um, and why we are like joining forces together uh, in this like overlap between IPFS and uh, lip 2 p um, I think it may be useful to kind of like understand the current state. Uh, I'm not sure who created those like three uh, like questions, but those, I find find those uh, super super useful way of looking at them. Uh, Jacob, like if you, if you want to go, go ab about current state or should I like go over the points I've had it and then you can add yours maybe. Yeah, if since you added those sub points, if you want to go, go yeah, over so, those first. So just like uh, to unpack my, <laughs> unpack where, where my mind is uh, right, like right now. Um, so browsers and connectivity uh, as a special uh, interest group between IPFS and lip 2 p um, Doing this like summary of where we are right now when it comes to the state of, uh, it, it's really fuzzy between like JS IPFS and JS lip 2 p Often when I say like JS IPFS, I really mean JS lip 2 p because it's just, uh, that's what effectively takes care of connectivity in uh, JS IPFS, but like not everyone watching this video or like joining the uh, community, IPFS community may be aware of that. Uh, so the key, like the highlights of the current state in my mind uh, is that like the entry point are bootstrap nodes. Those bootstrap nodes are listening on WebSockets right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure we always dial the same bootstrap node every time our JS lip 2 p node starts. And that's sort of like the first thing, like maybe not like personally, but often like when I had like discussions on conferences and, and people approaching me on IRC and other channels, that was always like the first red flag for people like that we always dial those nodes, those the same nodes, like a single point of failure at the entry. Uh, and we don't remember when we like discover other peers on the network, um, other like nodes that are capable of WebSockets or other transports that we have in web browser, we still don't like store them and reuse them later. We, if you like close the tab, you shut down JS IPFS process and then you open it again, everything starts again. So that's like the, the one uh, thing. Um, kind of related to connectivity because like if we like, Persist the peers, we may be like more robust against like censorship, but also against like network failures when thirds of our bootstrap nodes or, or some misconfiguration happen. Uh, you don't fail uh, to boot your node, uh, it would work. And then there's a problem space related to the fact that we don't have the HT in, uh, in JS. Um, and that means uh, what do we do for discovery? So right now, basically everyone that's using like uh, JS IPFS, maybe I'll say, I preface that, that everyone using JS IPFS in like web browser context, mainly the context of regular web pages, uh, they, you, they either use our default or run their own WebSocket star server, which provides both like discovery, but also like relay. Um, and then we got this delegated routing, which, uh, works but like uh if uh, i i i mean like i've set it up in brave but brave is a special context when we are able to establish tcp connections so there it makes sense the problem in web browser context is uh, even if we like 
enable delegated routing and uh, someone like runs their own server for that. The problem is like everyone on DHT is listening on TCP and nearly nobody is listening on web sockets. And the problem in web browser uh, context is that like most of people will run just uh, IPFS or, uh, or like just uh, lp 2 p on in secure context, which means that secure context will only be able to connect to uh, like web socket port that's encrypted. That requires establishing TLS certificates, and that's not something Go IPFS or just IPFS supports out of the box, which means you got this additional configuration overhead. You need to set up an NGINX and so reverse proxy in front of that, set up certificates and stuff like that. Um, and also, like we also did not wire all the config options in Go IPFS, but that's like a minor detail. The biggest problem is this configuration overhead. Um, so that's why like delegated routing, like it works. It works in Brave right now. The problem is like what's, what's announced in DHT, like how useful those records are. And then there's the last leg, uh, often like in my mind, it's like WebRTC or like the fact that we are actually not using it uh, today. Uh, it's uh, disabled by default. Historically, it was like just crashing browsers. Uh, I did some tests later. Uh, we had some discussions with browser vendors. Uh, so it moved from like crashing with uh, a few connections. Now you can have like 50 or maybe more, probably more today. Uh, but still, uh, users had some uh, users been reporting. Uh, uh, there are some user reports about like different uh, numbers of connections, different use cases, and at which point it there was always a point when something crashed. So uh, WebRTC, the current uh, implementation of our WebRTC transport, mainly like WebRTC star, I believe, uh, those are disabled by default. Some people had success, I believe, like, oh, gosh, what was the name of the video streaming service? They tweaked, I remember, the, I think they forked our transport, and they tweaked uh, like either like the data, uh, data stream, like chunk size or something. And they reported some success. Uh, I linked like the issue uh, to with some those reports. Uh, but anyway, it, it's just like me. Yeah, and this I, this is an area where I feel like it is the crashing isn't the problem necessarily. Crashing is always a problem, but browsers are also well used to that, and they want to know more when things are crashing. So I think there's two things here that are really important: is one, identifying the right configuration that doesn't crash. Like if we if we need to reduce our connection count and cap it. At a, at a non crashing state, testable across other browser grade. But the other half of that is actually building our relationships with browser vendors such that our input and our minimized test cases are into their product development cycle and engineering decision making so that we can start to affect their, their, their decisions based on what our needs are. And that's a thing we can do. Yep. Uh, yep. So that's like for we are not using WebRTC by default, but there are like options. Uh, just to quickly uh, close up. Um, uh, we got like basically like WebRTC requires some sort of a signaling. Uh, so we got a uh, WebRTC star which is using WebSocket, uh, WebSocket for signaling. And after you uh, exchange those uh, uh, session information, then you establish peer to peer. Or there is a, like variant uh, WebRTC direct, uh, both for Go and JS. And that variant uh, is using uh, HTTP. Just like a regular HTTP endpoint for signaling, and then uh, the connection established. Uh, so, like, we got some transport. Uh, we some people are like using uh, for specific use cases, but we don't use WebRTC. It's not enabled by default. Uh, Jacob, if I missed something or mischaracterized. Yeah, no, it's that's accurate. Um, however, with the libp2p refactor. Um, and the JS IPFS refactor, WebRTC star will be enabled by default for the browser. Um, I think that the only issue there is we still need to relaunch um, some WebRTC star servers. We'll be shutting down like WebSocket star is going away because there were a lot of issues migrating that, um, refactoring that because of socket IO. Um, but we didn't have to do those things for WebRTC star. So it's going to take the place of WebSocket star. So we'll be looking at 
taking some of the WebSocket star servers that we host and then changing those over to WebRTC star. Um, so we will have that. And then, yeah, that's, that's a good rundown of the current state. And I think a lot of the things you went over are things that I have listed solutions in my backlog for that I want to tackle this year. So that is, that is good. I, I really like the, the idea of like, uh, I, I think I uh, put a question mark about like, uh, um, like improving uh, star situation. Uh, and I feel that what you, you just said, like switching to WebRTC, it will like make stuff better given that we would no longer push bytes through that like relay, like all the bytes, we would just like uh, use that for signaling. Um, so that's like a step in the right direction. Um, what are the like the major issues uh, either the P2P or IPFS users face today in a web browser context? Uh, I, like I, I listed uh, lack of DHT, which I mentioned before. Uh, the, another pr common problem uh, on forums like Stack Overflow and going over and over was like uh, a lot of stuff requires manual configuration. Uh, like hard coding specific servers uh, that also implies like semi centralization, which means you either use like most of people <laughs> when they start playing will use like, the default bootstrap servers or WebSocket star servers, which are listed like just for demos, but everyone is using them. Um, and it's like uh, either lack of documentation or too many steps, like too many services to set up, like bootstrap servers, WebSocket stars, preloads, and then delegates. Those are like four things, which probably could be just one thing. Um, uh, and then in th this is specific to JSIPFS is uh, the problem of data preload. It's sort of like a, um, uh, like in lip 2 p we, you, we got the, those like delegated routing. So like uh, data preload is like delegating caching of uh, the data you, you just added to your local JSIPFS node. Uh, so it's basically like asking every time you add something to your local repo, uh, there's also like HTTP request to some remote API uh, to that remote node. Hey, please fetch that from me <laughs> in case I disappear. And so that's like when you, uh, upload something to IPFS in your website or uh, running or uh, in uh, using a node running on a web page uh, and you close your laptop in theory if you gave it enough time but that data it's still available to other peers because it's cached in on that like remote node uh, data preload is like specific feature of JS IPFS. It's not in Go. It's just like in JS IPFS, and it was added specifically for this browser context. Uh, and basically, I always I think we will collapse given like a partial solution to this like too many things to configure. We will probably collapse delegate nodes and preload nodes. Those will be like one thing. We'll probably just call them delegates because um, we like. Adding, we keep adding stuff and we probably should like start merging them together. Um, uh, Jacob, do you see uh, from the like lip 2 p side or maybe some of your users, are there like any other like pain points we did not list here? Yeah, I think you touched on like one of the biggest pain points I think with lip 2 p is really like the manual configuration, like configuring lip 2 p is painful for people. Um, with the refactor, we, we've like added a configuration guide, but I still think for most people that's that's a large overhead. So I think something that we may look at trying to do this year is actually like we have in GSIPFS, we've got like the you know runtime files, and these are like the pre-configured things. But then there's like GSIPFS has like a bunch of different because it's run in so many contexts, it has like multiple ways to configure libp to p, and it's like a nightmare to look at. But I think going through from a libp2p standpoint, we can at least, hey, here are like pre-bundled libp2p, like based on, we talked about what are these contexts that people are gonna be running libp2p in, and we can pre-bundle that for them so they don't have to worry about it. They can just like import libp2p for their specific contacts and then get up and running. And at least, yeah, we may have some of those things 
like the semi centralization pre configured because we need to. But if we have, if we're persisting peer stores and things like that on subsequent startups, we should be able to reduce our um, dependency on those semi centralized servers the longer our nodes are running. I, I really love that progressive kind of progressive enhancement of connection state approach. Uh, I think it reflects the, the the pragmatic view that most people a decentralization is a is if not a goal at all a a far far lower tier goal for them, and that by getting people in the door using the tools and approaches that they're most familiar with, we can then expand that kind of like initial foothold that we get and slowly migrate people over to thinking a bit differently about the type of network architecture and how that onboarding happens. As well, from the availability standpoint, there is not a decentralized option for people at all today in web browsers, period. Like the, 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 the initial step there is always going to be centralized. So how can we take advantage of that centralization and use it as a wedge to get in there, I think is, is exactly the right, the right approach and the way to think about it. And the, having a, a, bet, a language like the way you just described it, Jacob, I think is really helpful for understanding how we make those decisions and be able to talk about where, that, that spectrum of, of thinking about centralized and decentralized as a spectrum, not as a binary. So I, 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 I'm totally plus one on thinking about things that way and really centering this idea of bundles as, as being very user-centered in how we understand what developer needs are, which is plus one on that too. Awesome. Uh, so, all right. What improvements can we make this year? <laughs> um, I made a list, and I, I'll go briefly over this list. <laughs> I like making lists. Um, so, um, yep. Um, just like I mentioned, we probably the low hanging fruit is like say, at least saving uh, for later use uh, all the peers we have discovered. Um, it may be, and probably we, we should also like, it may be like generic thing for the P2P, but like, like tracking peers who are like always available, like over like days or like for some time, uh, and assigning some weight to them. Cause like in web browser context, it's, I, I feel it will like give, give like much more, like you, you could like visibly see stuff happening faster than like in Go or other contexts, um, mainly due to the, like the cost of establishing connections. Um, so that, that, that's like the first thing. Then there's like huge epic about sunsetting uh, star protocols, uh, which is sort of like, um, the, the problem is like uh, to sunset stuff, we would have to have like, existing solution that replaces it. And that's work in progress, that's my understanding. So uh, I just copied a uh, roadmap, I extracted the uh, roadmap from uh, the issue here. But basically my understanding of uh, the high level plan for synthetic uh, star protocols is that like, we got the rendezvous uh, like protocol specs out. I think we got like initial implementation, but it's not actually like that tested or used. used. So probably that's the, the, the first thing is see, see what's there like uh, document it start maybe using it in some our like internal projects maybe ATFS companion maybe note using brave places like that where we like uh, got understanding how stuff behaves right now um, and then when we are like happy with this solution like deprecate uh, star at least like from the default configuration. I believe like the star will always be there as an option for people because some people will just like prefer that that would be like thing for the use cases. But like switching the default from like hard coded servers to the maybe rendezvous. Um, and similarly for like WebRTC star, uh, sw switching like that centralized one to the one, one that's using the circuit relay. Um, I'm not sure like Jacob, do you have like any thoughts or strong opinions on this roadmap? Is it like overall the good direction? Yeah, so I think I want to re reevaluate this roadmap as part of this year. Um, 
like I said, I think star some version of star protocols will probably exist for quite a while. Um, but I think there are various solutions that we can look at to improve connectivity. And the, the biggest thing here I see is really like discovering peers who have pertinent, who have content that I care about, whether that's like application developers being able to connect just their applications and they don't care about the public network um, or it's nodes wanting to join the public network and then trying to find nodes that they care about on the network. And so I think there is a myriad of things that we can look at doing to decentralize that, like having actual like a peer exchange protocol um, where we can, instead of leveraging the star servers, we can actually, once we connect one another, whether that's using rendezvous um, or some other mechanism of finding those peers is then I can then exchange with the, the peer I connect to, I can exchange the peers that I have with them so that they can then get a list to like hydrate their peer store um, and then persist that. And then when they come online and reconnect to somebody else, right, we can just continue to, to share those peers around. So I think one of the things that I want to do is kind of take the idea behind decommissioning or like sunsetting the star protocols and really focus on like, what are we trying to achieve in terms of like connectivity and like finding peers that we care about and then create like a list of options, um, like somewhat thought out options so that we can then go through and like which of these or multiples of these are gonna be the best for what we need um, so that we can actually create like a work plan for, for getting those things done. I, I know that like the new, I'm not sure if it's shipped, like the new IPFS IO website was uh, the, one, the key like element or a feature was uh, sort of like a, uh, a set of questions. What's, what, what do you do? Like, what do you want to achieve? Uh, and based on the, those questions, uh, different uh, like IPFS implementations or like ways of using it or deploying it were presented until we probably need something like that for the browser context, uh, like both for like JS IPFS and JS lip 2 p uh, depending, cause, cause like people will, will create the uh, apps and some people will just like I, I said, like they, they will probably want to run their own bootstrap. Probably they, they will be fine with their own like web, some sort of like a centralized uh, signaling server. Um, but like, so, so those options still be viable. I think we just need to ensure stuff does not break when like a single signaling server goes away. <laughs> um, and uh, clearly document uh, what are the options, what are trade-offs, um, and what are, like, and emphasize that you can like use multiple ways, like multiple discovery, all the, the like the modularity of both like JS IPFS and dp 2 p I feel is often like skipped or not present in, in docs. And people are not aware that it's not like they need to choose, they can like, use multiple discovery methods and stuff like that. Um, so I, I had a, there a section uh, with like question marks uh, regarding like improving star situation before sunsetting it. So I, I feel like you mentioned the WebRTC, uh, like switching to WebRTC as a default, uh, like in the default configuration would be like part of that. Uh, and there's a separate topic of replacing WebSocket star with this new Stardust protocol. The problem is like, it's a new protocol. <laughs> well, yeah, so it's it's been around and the Stardust was, it was also running on, um, it was running in JS IPFS, I believe. Um, I need to check, um, or at least a preliminary version of it. Um, the advantage is like we don't have to like leverage socket IO and it does kind of like a peer data exchange. Um, so it, it is an option for like replacing WebSocket star, um, at least in the interim, because WebSocket star was like the socket IO stuff is just a nightmare to, to refactor back. Um, but I think it's, it's one of those things, it's like a stop gap, right? Of like, until we get like the rendezvous server till we get like WebRTC distributed signaling um, over relays, things like that, um, where any node could be a, a signaling server. 
that like we should have some stopgap in place. And so that was like, hey, if we get Stardust in place, that's another option that people can use um, in addition to WebRTC star until we get these other things finished. Yeah, it's it's it sounds viable. Uh, I was like looking what would need to happen on our like infra side if we would want to make a switch. And I feel like the switch you mentioned that uh, like switching the default or, like bundle distribution to like WebRTC star. Uh, at the same time, we could uh, but, like remove the WebSocket star and, and switch like either documentation or. Uh, yeah, probably if you if we no longer like run a Stardust by default, like switch the documentation and point to Stardust. Uh, the thing is that uh, Stardust requires separate set of servers. Uh, those like signaling servers would be, uh, yeah, like totally new ones. So if we like create uh, probably like if we create a set for WebRTC star. I think it's running. I think we have for WebRTC. Yeah, so we have WebRTC star. It needs to be redeployed. Um, it's like, I'm pretty sure it's like 502ing right now. Um, so we need to improve our infra around that um, soon, like in the next weeks. And then we have, so we have one WebRTC star server. We actually have three WebSocket star servers, but we only ever point to one right now. So one of the thoughts is to like, leverage the other two that we're not pointing at and then also move those over to WebRTC and then have three running, right? Because like mm -hmm. we do have historical issues only being able to open so many WebRTC stars. So if we can get like, hey, we have three servers that are running, then we can also make sure that if one of them goes down that we still have the other two until we can get them all back online. Yep, definitely we need more than one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I've seen Oli uh, doing like, redoing infra and provisioning of uh, preload slash delegate node. Uh, so probably like those uh, star ones will be next in queue. Um, yeah, I think we, we've mentioned uh, improving the UX of running your own, uh, but basically uh, something I, I noted here is uh, like, maybe encouraging people to run their all like, like I, I believe like language is important and I'm not sure if like federated services is a good branding for this, but basically going away from centralized services. Um, so like making easier for people to, to run their stuff, making it probably just one, running one thing instead of like running four things. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the Key one is like setting up bootstrap node, which is capable of listening on WebSockets. Uh, that's something we like. Without this, everyone will be using the default ones, and it's uh, probably better for everyone if uh, we improve this. Um, I talked with uh, Steven about the idea of um, adding support for. TLS to go IPFS, but specifically not for HTTP gateway, because that's like a kind of worms we don't want to open yet. Uh, but just for uh, just for WebSocket, uh, see if we like maybe we would be able to create some sort of like a configuration when you just set one flag, like provide a host name or something. And like Go IPFS would automatically get served for your domain. Um, th that's just like an initial draft that uh, a draft of initial idea that we maybe we could improve that by providing native support for like TLS on web, uh, of, on WebSockets in uh, places like Go IPFS and JSIPFS. Um, but that would be have to be scoped just to that one transport. Um, yeah, I think the Go um, there's a team that's been trying to work on, like they need this because they're like, they're taking Golib P2P and they're compiling it to WebAssembly and then using basically that same thing of like communicating over WebSockets. 
um, but they having the problem, this this exact problem of the WebSocket transport in GoLibrityP doesn't support WSS. Um, and so, and they're having that problem of they originally wanted it to be decentralized, but they, you have the whole issue with needing to use a certificate authority because you have to get certificates and that whole nightmare of, well, it has to be specific domains or can you do wildcard domains? And yeah, it's, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. And as, as, as a person working on subdomain gateways, which if you want to have HTTPS, you also need wildcard certificates. I'm deeply aware of the problem space. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it's probably uh, like the probably realistic way of tackling those issues would be um, be more pragmatic than just like going at full, full force with some setting star protocols because that may take time. Uh, so like the, what would be the first stage we would uh, if we had like the first milestone that would be probably uh, after like the refactors are done uh, switching to, the, to web RTC star right as a default that would be the first thing for this year. Yeah. So, and that is like, it's being, it's been added to the JSIPFS refactor branch. Um, like it's already in there for the browser. Um, the big thing that we need to tackle is, is getting the, the signaling servers up so that we can properly configure those. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm not like saying garbage right now, but I don't think we have access to WebRTC APIs from service workers. Or do we? I don't think we do. I'm not sure. That's a good uh, question. So assuming I, I'm right, uh, we would still like uh, that switching to start that probably would be necessary anyway. Because if someone wants to run like JSIPFS in service worker, if they are like brave enough, <laughs> um, they would not be able to use WebRTC, and that means they would need uh, like WebSocket based one. Because you 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 can establish WebSocket, uh, like uh, WebSocket connection. But I'm pretty sure I remember there were maybe not all browser vendors, but it was not universal. Either Firefox or Chrome did not allow for Web, WebRTC. Um, I think there's there's like open ticket maybe it was Chromium uh, about like allowing data channel connections from service worker. Uh, like when service workers were created, the WebRTC was only used for audio video. So it was like, I, that not, does not make sense. So let's just block it. And now we don't have access to WebRTC, I believe in some vendors. Uh, sorry for the question, just like, um, Yeah, and so the Stardust refactor is happening. Um, Fushko is working on that, but he's he's out for, I think, another another week. Apologies. I think I dropped for like a few seconds. <laughs> and, and I think Jacob just said Fushko's still out, but. but. It's on his roadmap. Is that this That's quarter? Good. Yeah. So he he was working on that because um, we were originally trying to get it around get it out around the time that the refactor goes out. Um, so I think it'll just come out uh, probably a couple of weeks later. Yeah. So, sounds like a plan. Yeah. Maybe mid mid February. Mm -hmm. uh, did we miss anything? <laughs> probably. <Yeah. laughs> I, I added another item to the agenda at the bottom after yeah. subdomain gateway. All right, Jacob, do you want to like add, add anything or are we like no, sleeping, uh, on, sleeping on this? <laughs> yeah, no, this is, this is helpful. So ultimately what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, all the things that we talked about here and then start putting together um, a more 
formal roadmap of the things that we want to tackle um, and then share that out so that we can um, start iterating that and then make sure that we're prioritizing, prioritizing, tizing things appropriately. I became a Go developer this week. So <laughs> I'll probably, yeah, so I'll probably uh, take, uh, unless someone steals those issues from me, uh, all those like, uh, all the problems or missing pieces for people to easily run their own like bootstrappers and stuff like that. Basically, I want like just Go IPFS or JS IPFS to be enough. Like you don't need to install like any additional stuff. You probably like get us to the point where we, you, you may need to like enable some flags, but you don't need to like install anything additional um, to remove like the friction and like cognitive overhead for people who want to like run their own infra. Otherwise people will just say, all right, I don't have time for like reading this, <laughs> setting this up. I will just use those defaults unless they break, then I will start reading this. Uh, so. Can, um, can you so I have, I have one ask for this work can you can you summarize that that outcome so where we're going to be where you want like the target that you want to hit at the end of the quarter so we have an understanding of kind of what the what the objective is from a developer experience standpoint for people that are wanting to use JSIPFS in this context uh, what, what has changed is uh, is the goal going to be for example is a zero config uh, is the goal going to be better connectivity with existing config um, but just a summary to be able to understand where we're getting at in this in this broader context for this quarter's work that we can use as the OKR for the browsers and connectivity work in the in the ecosystem group would be super helpful. Uh, we want to yeah, definitely before team week have that locked down. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I can flesh it out. Uh, basically, I need to like think about like the scope, like the current scope, what people need to do, like. Go IPFS and then Nginx and what they need to set up in Nginx and see what we are like re like re realistically can like move uh, to Go IPFS uh, configuration wise. Uh, yep, totally. Um, subdomain gateways corner maybe. Uh, let's 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 do this. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's very quick. I became a Go developer this week and picked up a PR with uh, subdomain gateways. And uh, the thing I wanted to get to work was basically like the gateway on localhost. And it, I got it to the point where I was able to like load Wikipedia from like that IPFS localhost uh, domain. Um, so CID is in domain, it loads and it, all the paths, the Wikipedia is a very good test case because there's like assets, relative paths, it's sharded directory. So if anything breaks, it will break on the Wikipedia. And cool stuff is that like, we not only got those like CIDs, uh, we also got like IPNS namespace and it works the same as IPNS path namespace. So if someone puts domain name here, we will resolve DNS link and load a content addressing path from that path. That means in, this is what we needed for like IPFS companion to redirect from uh, Wikipedia on IPFS.org to your local node without breaking your origin isolation. So this is a cool example because like this is a regular website. We even get this human readable name here. Um, same with like our docs website. Uh, and what's cool is that the existing integration with ENS guys also works with this. So we got those uh, ETH domains <laughs> loading from localhost gateway, uh, which is pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, so uh, that's good. Uh, we'll land at some point. <laughs> Need to figure it out uh, some some kinks around um, the configuration. I want to like add some keys which are not there so i need to add them and wire them them up and also um uh, need to like do some refactors to like shuffle stuff around because like 
in someone if someone is running dns link website and a gateway on the same domain name we want to prioritize uh, content paths probably uh, just uh, just to like remove edge, edge cases so a, a good example is like ipfs io it's a path based gateway but also a regular website which is backed by dns link so what happens if that DNS link website has like IPFS subdirectory? <laughs> um, should we open that from the DNS link or should we open that from the gateway? Uh, like edge cases like that. Um, but I believe that's it for, for this update. Um, stay tuned. That's, that's, that's fantastic news. Is this targeting uh, 0.5 IPFS? Yes, yeah, that should okay. land with uh, uh, by the end of, I think all point five is planned uh, by the end of the quarter, and uh, this will be included. I also backported. Uh, it's not on the agenda, but I backported some web uh, UI pa patches, which um, which will land sooner. It will those uh, web UI patches will land in uh, for uh, all po four twenty three, I believe, before all point five. Do, do you know? Is is there a point? where we're drawing a line in the sand, like a feature freeze on what web UI changes will be included, or what web UI version will be included with going to Uh I believe, I believe the, it, it's still open. <laughs> uh, it, historically, it was just like when the new web UI was released, we just uh, PR'd a uh, hash change to go IPFS. Now that we got like end-to-end -end test suite, uh, it's even like easier uh to just bump it that's that's fantastic yeah because we can do that with the knowledge and at least the main the main workflow didn't break yep. thank you Lytle. Uh, i forgot one more thing <laughs> i promise it will be brief <laughs> um one more thing uh i'm not sure how sane or insane this is but just a shower idea i had uh there's like a header called clear site data uh and if a server returns that header, uh, it forces a user agent to remove all cookies or all storage for specific origin. Uh, and it, this sort of uh, may be a way for us to incentivize people for people who want to use IPFS for like the dynamic websites uh, or maybe dynam dynamic web apps which use web APIs. Uh, tied to origin uh, to incentivize those people to people to use uh, their own domain or use subdomain uh, gateways uh, basically by purging cookies and storage every time they load anything from path based gateway that way the path gate path based gateway would be still useful for like assets like images and like static websites but you would not be able to shoot yourself in the foot <laughs> by like relying on origin isolation. Um, it probably is something we will think about when like subdomains land in stable Go IPFS and JS IPFS. But I thought I mentioned it here in case it's a bad idea. If it's a bad idea, please comment on this issue. <laughs> All right, uh, next one, I believe, Dietrich, Brave Roadmap. Yeah, the, um, so w one of the things that this, this came up, you know, we've talked a lot about the like, goals that we have and where we want to get to with, with Brave. Uh, for context, we still have an incoming grant uh, application where Ranger Moav will be working on Brave to Brave la DNS SD local discovery. So we can actually start working on for two Braves with embedded nodes on the same local subnet. They'll be able to interoperate and use IPFS to communicate directly, even if they're not connected to the internet. Super powerful demonstration of, of just how important actually having full node native integration in the browser is. Uh, and, and hopefully that'll start to happen this quarter. Uh, but the IPFS grant situation is still, uh, still evolving and just really getting started. So we're working our way through that. Uh, but there's a couple of other major bits that we've talked about for Brave support, and this came up in a conversation uh, 
Right. It's, it's really nice. It's so nice that Brendan is so active on Twitter and retweets stuff all the time. Like when you talk about the things that you want to do that maybe you're not sure if you can yet. Uh, so I didn't commit our roadmap publicly, but I did talk about some things that we know we want to do. Um, so there's a few things there like, like, like MDNS implementation. I think that, that the Brave community is really tolerant of, of hard experimenting hard and deep in, in this area. Um, and it's really something that we should be, we should take advantage of as much as possible. So the fact that we can actually lo get a, a, a local, uh, you know, a node that's in browser doesn't require any external daemon to be in, in installed, no IPFS desktop required, uh, and understanding kind of the limits of what we can do in that space from an experimentation standpoint, I think is going to be really powerful and can, can really galvanize that community around thinking about um, more, uh, thinking more broadly about what they can do when things like IPFS are actually just running locally available in some form to web applications. Uh, I think also that's a place where we have an opportunity to explore native protocol handler and desktop ex experiences. So, you know, the, the Opera implementation is going to give us a, a native protocol handler, but a behind the scenes HTTP gateway experience. And here we have the, com the opportunity to be able to have native, native protocol handler combined with a local node. And that's something that we have, we, we still have to figure out, see Andrew, uh, we have to figure out things like, you know, what, what is the actual capability, capability, you know, garden there, walled garden, whatever we want to, want to put walls from a security model standpoint. Uh, how does that security model align with the existing HTTP security model? Um, do we think to so, say like, if something's loaded in the, in the IPFS uh, native protocol, do we just like from the, from the start, it just be, like turn off all cookies? Yes or no, like we have the opportunity to be able to dictate how this security model works. And I, you know, I spelunked through the, through the, ancient, through the ancient scrolls of, of GitHub and there's many conversations about this, but no real decisions kind of around what this world actually looks like. And, and that's something that in order to be able to move forward and, and more seriously with both standards bodies and with browser integrations, we need to be able to have a very a clear and cohesive approach or at least understanding of what the relevant concerns are. Uh, how how they relate to the concerns that we have in the web security model today, especially around privacy and surveillance. Uh, and that, that's something that um, we, we, we kind of don't have written up in a cohesive way. And a lot of people have deep experience here, a lot of thoughts. It's kind of some of the architectural decisions around IPFS as, core, as a protocol itself. Uh, but IPFS in, in a web application context has uh, all this other stuff layered on top of it and uh, different concerns that we need to be able to to communicate really clearly about what our stance is and what our recommendations are for, for people that are integrating this into the browser if we want that to happen. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot to, to unpack there in just in the native protocol handler list of things that, that Lytle just showed in, in that tweet where I was like, these are top of mind things that we need to it, at the very least figure out this year and end 2020 with a, with a security model and a privacy model and an application model for what IPFS in the browser looks like. And I think those are three very distinct things. Um, so I'd love to see us, at, the, at a minimum, have an idea, like broad strokes, what we want for, for, for Brave and as, a, as an exemplar of browser integrations for this year. Uh, but I think really the end goal for the year, what I'd like to see is, is us having a really solid understanding of those three things, what the, what the security model for IPFS and browsers is, uh, what the privacy model for IPFS and browsers is, and then what, the, what those things mean in the context of an application model. Um, you know, the web application model is this HTTP what, delivering assets that are ultimately rendered, like HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And like that, that's, the application model is the combination of that network transport, the cap features and capabilities of the network transport, combined with this rendering context. This, this, what features does the browser give to the JavaScript that's actually being executed? What does it let it do? What it, where does it have dependencies on user interaction, which is a really key part of evaluating feature capabilities in the context of a security model. Um, so we, we, we need to get those things in place and be able to have a, a realistic and, and mature conversation with standards bodies and browser vendors. So that, that I think is a really, really important thing that we can do this year to set us up uh, for, for integrations moving forward, helping, helping make those decisions easier for browser vendors. And may, this is probably something that we should all sit down since we'll be a team week together and maybe just lock a few hours in to at least identify the things that we want, where do we want to be at the end of the year? Yep. And it's like a, the native protocol, it just sounds easy, but with libd web, uh, which we experimented in uh, 2018 uh, with Mozilla, 
uh, we've identified there like so many unknown, like now those are known unknowns, but like uh, there's no spec about like cross protocol requests or like JS execution. Absolutely not. It's like wild west. No one has no any idea. And it's interesting because it's like repeat, like history repeating itself uh, when HTTPS was added. Similar questions were raised, like how cross protocol requests should work. It was much easier back then because like HTTPS was just HTTP with encryption. Here we got like totally different like semantic protocol semantics or like security guarantees. So <laughs> yeah, like a lot, a lot of the threats, a lot of the threats in the existing model are pushed actually out, out a layer down into network network transport concerns. So it's actually like it, it almost more tightly couples the security and privacy models with the network transport layer as opposed to the application level layer. Yep, I I believe like we we should have a, a separate call regarding like brave blog posts. I don't think I schedule it tomorrow, but we may maybe just. I, yeah, no, I have that on my list to schedule. But between annual performance review stuff this week and and all the reorgs, I think I'm just gonna have to push that. To next week and then we can just spend an hour hacking on on a brave blog post yeah all right i'll create i'll create uh, that <laughs> promised async outline <laughs> for this <laughs> all right uh now we are at the place where there's ellipses at the end of our agenda so that may, may mean that we are at the end of the agenda are we at the end of the agenda i think <laughs> we are. miss anything right on time hi peter Peter is uh, on the call. <laughs> yes, hello guys. Uh, I just uh, dialed in to listen while I have been working on something in parallel. So yeah, just just want to see what this meeting is is like. <laughs> it's what the name says: is GUI browsers, and now it's GUI browsers and connectivity. We keep adding <laughs> adding stuff, and it remains one hour. So now we we, we need to like bump up the tempo or something. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, so far so good. Uh, I kind of, because there is a lot of stuff that I just keep trying over and over and I wait in the meantime. Uh, so I figured I'll just see, you know, uh, what other teams are doing kind of thing. So I'm just, you know, walk, walking around the calendar. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Uh, awesome. Uh, Jacob, any, anything that we missed? I don't think so. Right on time. Perfect. How how was it for you? The first call. It was good. I'm excited to do more of these. And get a roadmap together and start knocking it out. Yeah. Think about uh, timing. Maybe when Vasco is back, because uh, we it's right now it's just like me and Dietrich. Uh, Hack was dialing, but now he he's on the test ground. Um, we we can like discuss this i think i'll stop recording now so <laughs> sorry for not stopping recording before but uh, for anyone watching bye